Hi guys, this is Dr. Peracha again. Thank you so much for joining me today. To all my subscribers, I say thank you for your support. If you have not subscribed yet, I would encourage you to subscribe. You will find the information in my videos extremely helpful. Thanks so much. So let's get started. Today I'm going to be talking about how to treat chronic stable angina in 2019. I break it down into five components. Number one is lifestyle modification. Number two is risk factor control. Number three, drugs with mortality benefits. Number four, drugs to treat symptoms. And number five, advanced techniques. Okay, so the first component of treating chronic stable angina is lifestyle modification. And lifestyle modification has further components, so we'll go through all of them in sequential order. And I want to stress upon you, the first component is a healthy diet. Now, a lot of times I have doctors who tell the patients, hey, you know what? You should be on a healthy diet. Make sure your diet is healthy. They don't know what that means. I mean, you have to tell the patients exactly what you mean by a healthy diet. So let me tell you this. In 2019, these are the six components of healthy diet. Vegetables, self-explanatory, fruits, the third component is legumes. Now you read it and a lot of people have no idea what legumes mean. So let me give you a few examples. These are these type of foods are considered legumes. Chickpeas, kidney beans, green beans and lentils. They should be a component on, of everybody's diet. Next one is nuts. Nuts are very important. They've been shown to have a lot of benefits. Any type of nuts are okay. Some of the ones that are they particularly mention is walnuts, pistachios, and almonds. And then whole grains, whole wheat bread, brown rice, barley. They are very important. You have to have them. And lastly, fish. These are the six foods that have been shown to have consistent benefits. That doesn't mean they, the patients cannot eat anything else, but these six have to be given priority. Next component of lifestyle modification, increased physical activity. Please, for God's sake, don't tell your patient you need to exercise more. They don't know how much is more. Is 30 minutes good or 15 minutes? What is more for one patient may not be more for the other patient. So you need to give your patients an exercise prescription. You have to be specific. So this is the exercise prescription that I use for my patients. 150 minutes per week of accumulated moderate intensity aerobic physical activity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity. Now, what is considered moderate intensity aerobic physical activity? Let's define it. So there is no ambiguity. Brisk walking 2.4 to 4 miles per hour or biking 5 to 9 miles per hour. Now, what is vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity? Any kind of jogging or running. It doesn't matter what's your speed. If you are jogging or running, it's considered a vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity. Or if you are biking, it has to be greater than or equal to 10 miles per hour. Now, this is a very specific exercise prescription that you can use for your patients. Now, Pay attention to this word here, accumulated. Now that's very important. A lot of times patients say, you know what? I don't have 30 minutes right now, so I need to do 30 minutes, so I'm just not gonna do it. That's the biggest barrier. People don't have time. You need to tell them, you can chop it up. Your exercise, three 10 minute exercises. As long as the accumulated time is 150 minutes per week for moderate intensity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity, they're gonna be okay. Break it down. If you don't have time, break it down. Weight loss. Weight loss is very important. Normal BMI is 24.9 or less. Overweight is 25 to 29.9 and obese is 30 or more. If your patient is overweight or obese, the first thing you need to do is to tell them to go on a low calorie diet, 800 to 1500 cal kilocalories per day. That's very important. If you normal 
people, most of the normal people, men and women need 2000 to 2500 kilocalories per day. If you break it down to 1500, you're creating a calorie deficit. In order to lose weight, you need to create a calorie deficit. So that's very important. And number two is exercise. And the exercise prescription I just gave you on the previous slide. So make sure you tell it to your patients. Now, here is the biggest point that I want to mention to you on weight loss. Don't get obsessed with the numbers. Even decreasing a weight about 5% is considered a success and is associated in clinical studies with improved clinical outcomes, with better BP control, reductions in triglycerides, and LDL cholesterol and glucose levels. So let me give you an example. You have a patient who is five feet nine inches. His weight is 250 pounds. BMI is 36.9. Patient is clearly obese. So you help him decrease weight down to 237.5 pounds with low calorie diet and exercise. Now his BMI is 35.1. You would say, you know, I didn't make a big difference. On the surface, it will look like you didn't make any significant progress. You only achieved a reduction of 1.4 in his BMI. But let me tell you, it is a significant success. You know, you can't lose 10% weight without losing 5%. Every little bit helps. Moral of the story, don't chase an ideal BMI. If you would like to bring all your overweight on obese patients to a BMI of 25, that's not a good strategy. A little bit goes a long way when it comes to weight loss. Last thing, smoking cessation. Smoking is the single big risk factors for any type of vascular disease. You have to recommend tobacco abstinence firmly at every visit. And that's not just like you tell your patients, hey, you know what, you need to stop smoking. No, that's not that's not the way to do it. You have to spend at least five to 10 minutes of tobacco status assessment with cessation counseling. You have to ask your patients, how long have you been smoking? Have you tried quitting before? What are the barriers? You know, is there anybody else in your house that smokes or you hang out with friends who smoke? You, you gotta go in detail. You can't just say stop smoking. That's not effective. If behavioral interventions are not effective, you need to do pharmacotherapy. There are two types of pharmacotherapy, nicotine replacement therapies and non-nicotine replacement therapies. Nicotine replacement therapies, you know, smoking has a lot of other dangerous chemicals in addition to nicotine. With nicotine replacement therapy, we give them back a little bit nicotine, but they avoid all the other toxic substances. Patches, gum, lozenge, nasal spray, oral inhaler, are types of nicotine replacement therapies. There are non-nicotine replacement therapies. Bupropion is a drug. It selectively inhibits the neuronal uptake of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, which causes an increase in norepinephrine, which decreases nicotine withdrawal symptoms, and the increase in dopamine reduces nicotine cravings and the urge to smoke. That's the mechanism. Remember the mechanism. You need to remember the mechanism. Vereniclin is a new drug. It's an alpha-4, beta-2, neuronal nicotinic acetylcholine receptor partial agonist. It competitively inhibits the ability of nicotine to bind to and activate the receptor. It exerts mild agonistic activity at this site, though at a level much lower than nicotine, and this mild agonistic activity eases nicotine withdrawal symptoms and helps people quit smoking. Thank you so much for your attention. And you have a good day.